Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Wow. Okay. Hi, I'm Bill, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm also a gay man. Um, I'm also HIV positive. Um, and I, I say these things um, to, to preface a little bit what, I, what I'm going to talk about, um, which, which, um, which is shame. Um, so, so for me, I, I guess to qualify a little bit, um, my, my sobriety date is, is May 25th of, of 2015. Um, I started auditing the program in, in 2012. <laughs> Um, I realized I had a, a, a problem with drugs in, in, in 2002. Um, and, and I first started, uh, consciously numbing my feelings and, and beating myself up for it, um, when, when I was about 11 or 12. Um, and that's really when sort of my 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 story as an alcoholic starts uh, even though drinking or drugs wasn't a part of my story um i i started uh becoming aware that i was uh, attracted to men um at 11 and 12 years old and and um my parents uh were who were lovely people uh were also uh victims of of, of this disease and um I mentioned that only uh to to preface that by saying that you know they they were in their own world which allowed me to to sort of explore and be in mine and where that exploration led me was to um to uh restrooms and and public parks um at at 11 and 12 years old um and, and that's where I started experimenting sexually um that's where I started um really feeling that shame. Uh, prior to that, I, I just felt a little different. I, I felt, uh, sensitive and, 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 and I knew that, um, I was different from the other boys, but the actions that I was doing, uh, with these older men, uh, really sort of hit me deep. And I didn't realize how, how deep it was until really alcohol came into my life. Uh, in my late teens, um, the alcohol normalized me. Um, I, I found people who, who drank like I did. Um, and, and, you know, I, I drank like, like someone who's, you know, got a fake ID and, and who hung out with people who had fake IDs and the consequences didn't really happen right away for me. The, the wasn't really realized until, um, sort of later in life when, you know, I, that, that shame that I thought was going away with, with each drink was, was really just compounded, um, each time because, yeah, I was, I was no longer hiding my, my sex and my sexuality. Um, but I was doing things with people, uh, that I didn't respect. Um, I was doing things, um, Far beyond any sort of boundary that I would set up for myself, uh, time and time again, and and I was surrounding myself with people who did the same thing. So um, to me, it all felt very normal until uh, until it didn't. Which you know, later in my in my twenties, you know, my friends um, were uh, getting jobs and careers and families and relationships and 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 sort of letting go of the party life and. I didn't, I didn't know how to do that. Um, so I, I moved to San Francisco, um, when I was 28 and, and I did that, um, in part, uh, because I, I thought, well, this will be a good way to escape all of this sort of wreckage. And there was a lot, there was a lot of wreckage there. Um, but I also thought that moving here would be just sort of this, this, this awakening, like I, I would, I would find, um, I, I would find my tribe, 
um, here. I, I would walk into a bar um, and, and people would just welcome me with open arms and, and I would suddenly belong. And, and of course that didn't happen. I, I didn't have the skills to connect with people. I didn't know how to connect with myself. Um, so I, I, found, I found alcohol again. Um, and again, that just kept me down. It kept me separate. Um, I was really developing my, my, my skill with comparing my insides to everyone's outsides. And everybody outside was, was doing so well, uh, in, in my head. And, and I was, you know, I, I was still just this, this piece of shit that the world revolved around. And I thought you all saw that. Um, you know, meth was, was really my gateway drug. Um, it, it was the first real drug I tried, and I, I, I experimented with it a little bit in, in Arizona before I moved here, and, and it really brought me to my knees uh, in San Francisco. Um, and, uh, but I, I call myself an alcoholic uh, primarily because it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's the, the disease of alcoholism that I have. It doesn't matter what the substance is. Um, it's really just about what I put in to manipulate a feeling, which is really all I was doing with, with the drugs and the alcohol. So, um, you know, in my, in my early thirties, I thought it, it would be a good idea to, to get into a relationship. Um, so being the, the beautiful manipulator that I was, I, I became a person, uh, to attract someone else. And, and I did. And we, we ended up getting married and that became my identity. Um, and, uh, there was, and, and for me, again, the, the drinking and the drugs was done because he didn't do it. So, um, I, I thought that I had sort of created this life for me that, um, that was that of a, of a married guy. And I, I didn't have an identity outside of that. Um, but when that, when that relationship ended, uh, I, I was lost. I was, I was in my late thirties. Um, I was in my late thirties and I didn't know how to, to be a person. I didn't know how to stop crying. I didn't know how to, um, to, to go out and make friends and to create a, a life that was outside of the one that I had manufactured. Um, so I, I went back to drugs and alcohol and, and I went back hard. Um, that also, um, the one thing that I, I carried with me through all of that was this, this deep sense of shame that, um, I didn't know how to, to be a person. I, I didn't know how to create relationships that, that I saw all of you creating. Um, and I felt less than, and I kept myself feeling less than. Um, so I, I drank and used drugs at the end to, to really, uh, to, to really die. Um, it wasn't a conscious decision to do that, but it was very much, uh, I, I had given up. I had given up and, uh, I was forced, uh, as I said, to, to sort of audit the rooms in 2012. Um, I had so much anger and so much shame and so much resentment towards everyone. Um, it, but still trying to live in, in my own self will, uh, because it had gotten me through 40 years. So I, I, I kept trying to, to make that fit. Um, came in 2012. My first living sober was, was July of that year. Um, and, uh, it was really powerful for me because, um, what I saw there were, were people, um, connecting, uh, laughing, um, to being vulnerable, uh, expressing themselves in a way that, that seems so natural, uh, to them. And, and, um, I, I, I saw, I, I think at, at that time that, you know, maybe that's something that can happen for me, um. I still wasn't quite ready, uh, to, to put down the drink and the drugs yet. Um, so I, I kept going, uh, again, auditing the, the program for, for another, for another three years. Um, and then, you know, finally I, I came back in, in 2015 and, and, you know, for, for those of you who, who may be new or who, who may be struggling, um, I, I don't know how that happened. I, I don't know what the turning point was for me. Um, 
I, I knew that I was done trying to sort of fit the, the, the square peg in the round hole. And, and I decided, um, to, to really take suggestions that, that were afforded to me. And I, I checked myself back into a, an outpatient rehab. Um, and I, I started working the steps. I, I started working with a sponsor who, um, who had what I wanted. Um, I, I started taking suggestions and doing them even though I didn't want to. I started talking to people about that. I started um, sharing my feelings with people. And I started to to really hear um, you say uh, the, the words that, that still mean so much to me. Um, me too. Me too. Me too. Um, and that really hit home because for years I thought, you know, I was the only, you know, 12 year old, um, who, who sought out, uh, sex with, with older men. Um, I thought that I was the only one who, who, you know, did, did drugs and alcohol the, the way that I did. Um, and to come in these rooms and to hear you say, I get it. That was, that was really amazing for me. Um, and, you know, I, I today have just a little bit over two years uh, of sobriety. So, so what I'm like now, um, what am I like now? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think, but I can tell you what I'm not. And, and what I'm not is, is I'm not a piece of shit. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not a, a, a pile of garbage that uh, you tolerate. Um, I have value today. Um, I can uh, hold my head up in a room and I can talk to you uh, and look you in the eyes. Um, I act in esteemable fashion today. Um, I go to work. I show up. I, I do what's expected of me. Um, I don't lie to you anymore, which is really powerful, um, for me because it was all about, um, my life was all about creating something that made you happy in whatever way, shape and form that was, um, be it, you know, just, uh, uh, somebody making coffee for you or, or being an ear to listen to. If, if, if it made you happy, then I was happy. And now, you know, it, it's, it's really about, uh, feeling safe and expressing my authenticity to you um, and letting it be what it is. I, I just uh, attended a workshop on uh, trusting intimacy um, because I, I read the title of it and I immediately went to, nope, nope, I don't, I don't. And, you know, that's, that's, that's partially an old pattern. Um, my, 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 my core and my belief that kept me through 40 years has been don't trust people, don't let people in. Um, and now that's not true. Now I'm developing friendships and, and relationships of all kinds with, with, with many beautiful, uh, men and women, both in recovery and out. And, um, that wasn't possible with, with drugs and alcohol. That wasn't possible on the path that I was on before. Um, I will mention too uh, that my mom is also sober, and that's been a tremendous gift for me. Um, well, for us in our relationship, that you know we're 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 not a traditional mother and son. I mean, she she and I, she was my first drinking buddy, and, and we would come out to San Francisco in the '90s, and we would do our Halloween show, and uh, you know now we get to um, we get to support each other through this journey. So. Um, if you're new, welcome. Um, we, we, we want you here. And, um, this, this can be yours. Uh, if you, if you follow suggestions, if you, if you take some advice, if you hear, if you're willing to hear some, some difficult things, um, and if you're open to being teachable, those are all things that, that I hope, um, that I, uh, that I get to do today and and uh certainly not perfectly but certainly much better than i was before so i'm really happy to be here thank you very much
I'm an alcoholic. My name is Jason. Uh, I am honored to be here today. I've never been at a Living Sober here in California. Um, I was at a Living Sober in Virginia where I got sober, um, but it's a tremendous thrill, and it's great to see all of you. And thanks, Bill, for being honest and vulnerable. That's something. Um, it's up what I do here. I had um, my big book there. It's a little version of my big book. Um, no, I don't need it, but it's, I got it when I got sober, um, and I hold on to it so that I can kind of draw energy from it, but I know my story, so I'm just going to share it from you, with you. Um, I don't remember the very first time I had a sip of alcohol. I grew up in San Diego in the 70s, so I'm sure it was administered to me by someone, either whether I needed it or just as a lark, but um, my most vivid memory of a blackout uh, was in Mexico. I was 11. My mom had just married my stepfather, Mark, and my dog, Puji, short for Puja, who was a wine mariner, uh, was bitten by a scorpion, evidently, and had gone crazy. And so it had run slipshod into a wall over and over again, um, and I witnessed it, and I freaked out, and my mom, well, I think she may have given me a puff of something, but then I had a glass of wine, and uh, I didn't know that it was wine. I would not had wine and didn't recognize alcohol, but I knew that it was to make me feel better, and that it was my mom doing the best that she could, so I drank it. Um, and then... About two months later, still in Mexico, I had my first blackout, and um, it's a long story, but basically I arranged this sort of evening at this nightclub called El Tubo in Ajijic, Mexico, and it was this group with a couple of guys that were older than me and a few girls, and I danced like Michael Jackson, and because of that, I won a round of drinks for all of us for the entire evening. And I was really excellent dancer. And uh, I was trying to impress a boy. His name was Kent. He was 20. He had red hair, but it was dyed black. He wore braces. And uh, he drove a stupid car. But I thought the sun rose and set on him. And I wanted him to see me because no one else had seen me. Uh, we got very, very wasted. It started raining. We drove back to um, the house that we were staying in, and uh, I was 11, he was 20, so he molested me. And I thought I wanted it. I thought I wrote about it, but I don't remember it, because um, I had quite a few Cuba Libres, which I didn't even really know was a Cuba Libre until much later. Um, and I can't say that that's the reason that I started drinking alcoholically. Certainly there have been moments like that which were tragic and upsetting. But that particular moment, having done some step work, is where I traced my first real problem with alcohol. Um, I got sober in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, my sobriety date is July 22nd, 2005. So I just celebrated 12 years. And... Uh, I still feel like a newcomer, and it's remarkable how potent those memories still are about what it was like, that first drink. It's not that far from my memory. Um, but what's also not far from my memory is the ease and comfort that drinking gave me and wanting to numb out and wanting to detach from reality and life as I knew it, um, which was small. Um, I was a precocious kid. I was skipped three grades. Um, I graduated when I was 15. I had this huge party for my 16th birthday. Once again, there was a boy that I wanted to impress, Travoy. He was tall. He was dark. He was handsome. He wasn't very bright, but it didn't matter. <laughs> um, but I had this amazing party, and I was introduced to some powder in the bathroom, and that was the first time that um, I saw that drugs and alcohol could be really destructive. And I also saw that it could bring me closer to people. And I wanted to be closer to people. I wanted a connection. And it was consistent. Whenever I drank, there was a connection. It wasn't always the connection I'd hoped for, 
And it certainly didn't end well, but it opened the door and it helped me to sort of breathe. And how often I felt suffocated and not necessarily by anyone or anything, but I mean, I wasn't unpopular. I was bright. I was cute. I had the right polo shirt, all the stuff that you need when you're in grade school. But I didn't want to belong and everyone wanted me to be part of their clique or their crew. And I was a loner. So drinking helped me to release that. Um, anyway, I ended up throwing a lamp out of a window and the police were called. And my mom said, no one's ever going to love a faggot. And that part it, party ended pretty quickly. So I ran away. Flash forward. Uh, 21. I'm in Amsterdam. I've met a girl I really love, Salome. I wanted to stay in the country, so I was going to marry her. But while I was staying with her, I also had a boyfriend. He owned a cafe. He was very uh, influential in my drug and alcohol intake. And uh, that was the first time that I was paid for sex. I uh, painted my body silver at this club called uh, The It. And um, that night, the person that owned that club, Manfred, invited me and two other people to dance naked for him with copious amounts of alcohol and drugs, and that's what I did. And um, that was a f another time when I did things I did not want to do with alcohol and drugs. Flash forward to 30. Uh, I had my dream job. I'd moved to Brooklyn, New York. I had a boyfriend named John. I had a small dog named Herschel Walker. I had uh, a host of friends. I lived within two blocks of three really good bars. And I'd finally found a signature cocktail, a Manhattan, with extra bitters and no cherries. And uh, it took a while to get to that drink, but I liked it because I could see it at the bar. It took a while to get, so I had to wait for it. And um, it was classy. Uh, but I was the kind of drunk that would go to the bar, order a bunch of drinks, and pretend that I was like with a group of people. So I'd order that drink, and I'd order a, a beer, then I'd order a shot, and then maybe a margarita, and act like I was with a group of people, take those drinks, stash them around the bar, because I'd be out of money. And at that point, you didn't really have cell phones or like, you didn't, I never thought to leave my card at the bar. Um, but I knew that I would be out of money and I did not know when that drink would come. So I had to buy a bunch of drinks and stash them around the bar and pretend to be friends with wherever those drinks were. And um, flash forward, to 40. I'm sober. Um, I'm sober five years. I had a sponsor who's 70 named Brian. He was gay. He was sober, sober for 33 years. He had a partner of 30 years. He had several children, two of which were HIV positive, and he ran a halfway house about 40 miles south of Charlottesville. And as my first step, we would get into his car, which was air conditioned because it's very hot in Charlottesville. He would say something about how angry he was with his dad, and I would cry. And that's all I did pretty much every time we got together. We would drive in his car, beautiful bucolic settings, and I would cry. And it didn't really matter what we were talking about. It was just I needed to cry because I had held all of that in. Because I thought that's what you did. I thought you drank because there was a birthday party. You drank when you got fired. You drank when someone died. You drank when something was born. You drank when you got that great job. You great drank when you lost that job. I thought you just drank all the time. There was never an occasion not to. So that's what I did. But getting sober didn't happen easily. Um, as Bill mentioned earlier, you know, there was some auditing. There were some ins and outs. There were some missteps. Um, but my last drink wasn't 
on my sobriety date. My last drink was in that spring, and it was a glass of, a half a glass, actually, of crappy Malbec in this stupid restaurant that I worked in in Charlottesville. And I've heard it said that I've, <laughs> if I had known that was going to be my last drink, I'd had another. Um, but it became a thing. I finally heard someone who was not in the rooms say to me what I needed someone to say, which was, why don't you just stop? Like, no one had ever really said that to me, that it was possible to live a life without alcohol and drugs. I just, it was inconceivable to me. And when he said that, for some reason, it just clicked. My last drunk was when the police shined a light in my face. I was face down in a parking lot. I had a shirt on, but no pants. I had just gotten one of those pay-by-minute phones. It's about 1.30 on a Saturday night, no, Friday night. And the police are shining a light in me, and there's these two black girls from the projects who were telling the police that I was from Kentucky and that this was normal, that they would get me home, and he's just crazy. The police let me go, um, and then the girls disappeared, and I didn't know how I'd gotten there. I didn't know where my pants were. I didn't know where I, I had been before, except I do remember vowing to drink at every bar on this mall and uh, had something called a blue motorcycle at this place called Miller's. Um... I don't know what happened after that. I honestly do not know what happened after that, but it's daylight. It's a beautiful day in much the same way disasters have a beautiful day attached to them like 9-11. I walked home. Somehow I had bottoms. I get to my new apartment, which I'd only just painted with Martha Stewart's granite color. It was very, very tasteful, but I had no furniture. I get to my apartment, the door is locked, the, the window screen is missing, all the lights are on, the radio is on, the shower is running, there's a broken window in the back of the house, there is broken glass and blood on the floor, including plates, there's an arrow bed that's deflated, and I don't remember any of it, none of it. And all I could think of is I have to find this handle of whiskey that I left in this drawer. I know it's somewhere here. If I just can get to it, everything will be better. And I can watch that night and that week and whatever else happened, whoever I hurt. I didn't drive, so I know I didn't kill anyone. But I might as well have killed myself because that's what was happening. You know, in closing, I want to say... Um, When I got to the rooms, I didn't see anyone like me. And there was this girl named Esther. This is like my first two weeks in the rooms. And she, um, she's a tall black woman. And I didn't see a lot of black folks in Virginia where I got sober. And she was one of the sort of medical residents. And she, she's just this dazzling creature. And they asked her how she'd gotten sober. And she said, trust God clean house, and be of service. And that, coupled with what I remember about her story, which was she used to be a, a prostitute and a junkie, and then she was going for her PhD at Duke. And that happened in that period of time. So that's miraculous, the changes that can happen in this room. And then the other thing that happens when I think about how grateful I am to be part of this fellowship and this program, and living sober. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh, I think of this fondly. Uh, so there was a meeting I detested to go to because the same blowhards were always there. And everyone always said, that if you're going to the same meeting, you're not picking up a resentment, you're not going to enough meetings. So I went to this meeting at the suggestion of my sponsor. But there was a woman I loved there named Mary. And Mary had been smoking for decades, and she had a hole in her neck. And she had one of those microphones. And her voice sounded like this. And, you know, do the steps. Stay, honey. Just stay here. She said stuff like that. And uh, I remember I was trembling in this meeting and was sort of crying. And she said, 
speak up, honey. No matter what you did, I did it with a wig and a gun. And, and I have never forgotten that. And I don't know where, what became of Esther, and I don't know what became of Mary, but there are a lot of Marys in this room, and there's a lot of Esthers coming. So if you're new and you're not sure how this program works, don't test it. It works. Just keep coming. You'll figure it out. I did. Thanks. Hi, everybody. My name's Drew, and I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. Hi, I want to thank uh, the committee and all the volunteers here at Living Sober. I mean, what a lovely conference. And um, I also am just honored to be in the presence of these two men who spoke before me, Bill and Jason. Um, your vulnerability set the stage. And um, I remember when I was new, I was about 90 days sober, and I came to Living Sober. Uh, my sobriety date's April 5th, 1993, so I came to the 1993 Living Sober in San Francisco. I got sober in L.A., but there were like 3,000 people there, and um, it was at the old Bill Graham uh, Auditorium. And I remember it was freezing cold, and there were a lot of leather jackets, and that's just about all I remember. But around that same time in my sobriety, I, I remember I was... I didn't have a sponsor yet, and I was pretty shut down. And uh, I was at a big meeting in L.A. that I got sober at, Adventures in Sobriety. And um, it was time to thank the speaker. And so um, I just got caught up in the speaker line. That's just what you did. You know, I'm so grateful for the things that we just do in AA, the healthy habits that I've been able to adopt that you guys have shown me. But I got up to the front of the line, and the woman, this little woman, Chris, and she had a little cart, you know, one of those little carts because she couldn't walk very well. And she'd been sober longer than I'd been on the planet. And so um, I didn't know her at all. And um, there was two or 300 people in this meeting. So I get to the front of the line. I'm thanking her. I said, thank you for your share. And she goes, you're welcome. And she wouldn't let go of my hand. And there's all these people waiting to, to, to thank her. And she said, you're new, aren't you? And I really didn't like being new. I didn't know. Are there any newcomers here today? Anyone in their first year? Could you stand up and identify if you're in your first year, please? Hey, Charles. Hey, Jordan. Hey, Jeremy. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. This is the best deal in town, I'm telling you. So this woman, Chris, I, I was trying to pull my hand away from her, and she said, how are you doing? And I said, I'm fine. And I tried to pull my hand away, and she wouldn't let go of my hand. And, and she looked at me right in the eye, and she said, I hope you stay around long enough to fall apart so we can help put you back together again. Um, and I did that, and I'm still falling apart. And I was so inspired by your, both of your vulnerability up here uh, just a few minutes ago. So um, my first drink was when I was 12. And I don't know about you, but I have come to believe that I was an alcoholic since coming out of the womb because by the time I had that first drink, I was thirsty. I, I was so ready for a drink. And I had no idea. When I had that drink, it was like, oh, my God, the crops are saved. You know, the promises came true. I All of a sudden... <laughs> I, I felt like I had a plan for life, and it was going to include a lot of alcohol. And very shortly after that, I started smoking pot, and by the time I was 15, we were doing Black Beauties and P -P -P, uh, PCP, and I remember thinking before I got my driver's license that I really ought to stop all this stuff. But of course I didn't. Um, I never, you know, I didn't switch from scotch to brandy, I sort of added scotch to brandy. And by the time I got sober, um, when I was 32 years old in Los Angeles, um, I was practically dead. I, I had just run out of ideas. I really didn't want to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd tried everything else. And I was literally at that point where, you know, you can't get sober, you can't get loaded. And I didn't, I didn't want to die. Something you didn't want to die. Back in 1993, a lot of people were dying. And I was one of them. I'm pretty sure I would have been dead in six months from something you know, an overdose or whatever. But um, uh, the last day, you know, I was, um, I had a lot of last drinks. So my last drink um, was actually a Pabst Blue Ribbon, you know, not very classy, but I'd quit so many times. And so one more time I was quitting again. 
Um, I remember my best friend Peter had died like six months before, and I I knew I had to get sober for years, and I kept saying, I'll get sober when Peter dies, I'll get sober when Peter dies, and Peter would never die, he lived like another year, and so um, finally he got sober, and I couldn't, I couldn't stop, I couldn't stop, but this one day, I just finished off everything in the house one more time, uh, as was my pattern, uh, and it was a lot of stuff, it was, you know, pot, and K, and X, and perhaps Blue Ribbon Beer and Valium. And I went to this meeting in Santa Monica, um, the four o'clock men's stag, eight people around a table. I thought I was invisible. And um, I haven't had a drink or a drug since that meeting. And it's just a miracle. Um, when I came to AA, I really didn't know what it was about. I thought it was about not drinking. Um, but I've come to believe that's the easy part. And if you're new, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. The hard part is behind you. You made it here. I think so much about like how lucky we are, how we're the lucky ones that actually make it to Alcoholics Anonymous because so many people don't make it through the door. There's so many people out there suffering that never, never make it. Um, but we've made it. And, um, so what are we going to do now? Right. So I got a sponsor, Michael, who helped me work through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've come to believe that they are the keys to the kingdom and they have, um, helped me find a God of my understanding. I have um, uh, changed profoundly in my reaction to life. Um, I have gone from, you know, being almost flawless. Like when I got here, I was really close to, I had it all together, just this little drug problem, <laughs> to now I'm a completely imperfect human being that has usefulness in the world. And, you know, I wanted to talk today about um, sort of my higher power and um, becoming the, the men that we can become. I don't know about you, but in my family of origin, I didn't have like the upbringing that I wanted. And I didn't, you know, my dad didn't play ball with me as if I would have played ball. And he never took me hunting as if I would have hunted. But I, I always thought I was missing something, you know, like somebody to look up to and to really respect and to learn from. And I remember I had this camp counselor. This was when I was 11, the, the year before I drank my first drink. His name was Van and he was hot. He was 17. And um, it was this Canadian canoeing camp, Owakonzi. And he picked me to be his bowman. And he had a hairy chest. And it, I was just like in love. And um, he was my first mentor, I believe, because he believed in me before more than I believed in myself. And he, kept, he would always say, Drew, you can do it. And I, when I didn't believe I could do it. And he helped me do things I didn't know I could do. And he helped bec me become someone I didn't know I could become. And that was the first time I'd ever had that. I'd ever experienced that. Um, the second time I experienced that was I had a boss that was the same way. He was like, he would give me good feedback, like hard feedback, but I felt like he was always sitting on my side of the table, that he had my back all the time, no matter what, that unconditional support that I think I'd always wanted from my family of origin. And the third man in my life that gave me that was my first sponsor, Michael, who was so kind to me and so patient and loving. And he was on that side of the St. Francis prayer that I've always aspired to, which is the to love, to comfort, to understand, to bring light and hope. And um, he was so gentle with me because I needed a gentle sponsor. Some people respond well to, you know, the military type. And I don't, I think I wouldn't have been able to respond to that. But I, I realized that I've had the mentorship. I found the mentorship in Alcoholics Anonymous that I was always looking for. So when I was 10 years sober, I went back to see my dad in Kentucky. And I was 10 years sober. I was like, I, I had it going on. And um, my, my grand sponsor, Gilbert, told me after I turned 20, he said, you know, Drew, the first 10 years is detox. The second 10 years, you're a newcomer. Now the work begins. And uh, anyway, I thought I had it going on. And so I was talking to my dad and I said, Dad, you know, I don't think mom, you and mom gave me everything I wanted but or needed, but um, I found what I need um, in AA, really. And he said, what do you mean? So I told him about mentorship and the guys that had mentored me and what that meant to me and how they treated me and helped me become a man I didn't know I could become. And my dad, I said, so dad, who in your life was like that for you? And he thought about it and he said, Drew, you know, I don't know if I, I don't think I've ever had anyone like that in my life. And, you know, I thought I'd work through, you know, the ninth step with my dad and, and forgiveness and love for him. And when he told me that I had so much compassion for him to think that the reason I didn't get that stuff from my dad is because no one had ever given it to him. So we are really lucky and privileged in Alcoholics Anonymous. The other thing my first sponsor told me, the first time I sat down with him was he said, you know, Drew, the reason we do this is not to 
just work the steps and stay sober and have a spiritual experience. I was like, well, what are, what are we doing here? And he said, we do those things so that we can become a sponsor. And, um, you know, I've come to believe that the reason that I, we're here is to be of love and service. And I'm not by nature a loving and service oriented kind of person. Um, but you guys have taught me, are teaching me to be more loving and of service. And Dr. Bob said, you know, the 12 steps boil down into really two things, which are love and service. And I think service is love. So it's really all about love and trying to figure out how to be unconditional and to help someone with no expectation of anything in return. And I am learning how to do that in Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know, my dad died a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, and I was the son that showed up for him. I flew back to Kentucky like 10 times in two years. Um, I, my brother and sister went back once or twice. You know, I, when I was 14 years sober at, at Christmas, one more time, I almost said I'm the black sheep, but I caught myself because it wasn't true anymore because of Alcoholics Anonymous. My dad told me before he died, he said, Drew, I only wish that you could know the joy that I have had having a son like you. He wasn't saying that when I was 32. You know, he wasn't saying that before I joined Alcoholics Anonymous. And my mom is visiting now, and my mom's the kind of person who, you know, she's got a little mental illness, I think, and she, um, uh, what I believe today is, rather than judging her, that she didn't have what I've had in terms of learning life skills and how to be in the world. She'll say stuff to me like, oh, honey, there must be someone out there for you, you know, with that voice. I mean, she's so still, you know, she knows how to get to me. But she turned 80 in December, and she lost her two younger sisters in the last couple of years. And so I said to her, I said, Mom, I want you to think about someplace in the world that you've always wanted to go, um, that you've never been to, and I'll take you there, anywhere you want to go. And so she's, she thought about all these things. She's doing all this research and she decided on Italy. So I said, great. But then she got cancer. So she got cancer in December and had to have a full hysterectomy. And she's been on chemo since then. And so she's just up here for her first visit since she's been able to travel again. And so she's staying with me because she likes to stay with me. She's lost all her hair. She says she doesn't have as much hair as I do now, you know. And she um, has neuropathy in her feet. And she is having a hard time. And I get this opportunity to practice the principles I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous about how to show up for my mom. So I'm taking her on this cruise. And we decided to go on a cruise because I thought that would be easier for her. Now I'm so grateful that she's got neuropathy that we're going on a cruise instead of a land tour. And she was telling me this morning, you know, I made her breakfast and I, you know, pulled out everything and she's like, honey, there's so much food in the refrigerator. I'm like, that's where we keep it. You know, she, <laughs> cause we never, you know, at our house, it was like, you know, TV dinners and fudge sickles and licorice and pretzels. And that was our diet. And so I got to make her a really nice breakfast this morning. And, um, I get to be a good son to her. And, um, you know, I, I used to think, I hear people say sometimes, um, I came to AA and I got my life back. And I don't know about you, but I did not, I do not want the life I had before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. That has never been my goal. Um, and when I came here, I wanted a lot of the outside stuff. I wanted the, you know, the car, the boyfriend, the job, the house, the whatever. And, uh, I remember when I was 18 months sober and I'd been doing the work in Alcoholics Anonymous, I was living, I was unemployed, living in West Hollywood in this little apartment, driving an old Toyota, not in a relationship, like none of the outside stuff. And my heart felt full, like maybe for the very first time in my life. And it was that feeling that I'd always been looking for when I was, you know, trying to get out under the disco ball next to the guy with his shirt off when Donna Summer came on or whatever. You know, just the right combination. I'm just, I have to keep trying. You know, I was the kind of person that I would try harder if I didn't hit the mark. And um, so this day I'm walking down the street, down Sweetser, and I just felt like my heart was full. I was like, that's, I think that's what I'd always been looking for, to have a full heart. And I called my sponsor, I called Michael. I said, Michael, oh my gosh, I've, 
I don't know what's happening. I, I, my, I, my heart feels full. I feel so good. I, it feels like it's overflowing. You know, I thought I was having a heart attack. And he goes, no, I, he said, <laughs> I said, what should I do? He said, you should keep doing what you're doing. Um, cause it sounds like you're having a spiritual experience. And I, I realized today that I was having a spiritual experience. I, my heart was full. And he said, um, when my heart gets that way, I know that I'm ready to pass it on. I'm ready to give it back to somebody else. And I've come to believe that that's why I'm here to do the work. It's not so much for, for, for the person that I am. <laughs> Sometimes I say, you know, if I became the person I wanted to be, I always wanted to be, I'd be Ryan Reynolds. And um, he did play Drew Paxton in the proposal. I mean, just for the record. <laughs> um, so, but AA is teaching me to become the best Drew that I can be you know, which is completely imperfect and full of the seven deadly sins and thinking about myself almost always still, but not always. You know, I don't think about myself all the time. I pick, I answer my phone. AA has taught me how to pick up the phone even when there's caller ID. I can do that. And so I think about, you know, there's a line in the, the discussion of step five and the 12 and 12 that says, for those of us who have made progress in AA, Humility amounts to a clear recognition of who and what we really are, truly are, followed by a, a sincere attempt to be all we can be. And what that means to me, I need to take a look with my sponsor and the, the fellowship around me at all of the gifts that God has given me, all of my assets and defects, and try to get the defects out of the way enough so that the God that I believe is inside all of us can present to the world. And that my job is to help other people get to that point and figure out how to do that. You know, I used to think it was about following my dreams and making my dreams come true, but Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me that it's really about helping other people uh, get on this path, feel safe, open their heart, and follow their dreams. So if you're new, stick around. It, it really... Um, it really works, and you can do it. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.